Hey everyone, it's Elo. I hope that you're doing well. Today we're going to have a story time. We haven't had one in quite a while, and I know that some people really, really enjoyed um, that style, so I figured I would try to accommodate again, and it's taken me some time to think about what would be worth talking about, and I settled on concerts and a specific time in my life uh, that I refer to as the Second Ave House times. So if you're interested, we will um, talk about those now. So my concert going history, I guess, started when I was pretty young with two, I mean they were eventful for me, but not very story-worthy um, shows. I think I was in like the sixth grade when I went with my parents to see Cher live in concert, uh, which was actually really cool. It was kind of awkward because my parents were like kind of on a date and they were never really romantic around us kids or lovey-dovey. I, I can't picture them kissing, um, but they seem to be more happy having a good time uh, at the concert, so that was kind of weird. I was kind of like a third wheel to my parents, um, but I just turned my attention to the stage and was watching, and Cher put on a really good show. There was a large um, animatronic elephant that she was like riding at one point. It's very strange, uh, but the music was good. She sounded really good. Um, the second concert that I went to was Elton John, um, and that was by my own choice. When I was in eighth grade, um, there was a rite of passage that I was going through in the Catholic faith, which I was attending Catholic school at the time as well, and it's called Confirmation, and it's kind of like one of the bigger sacraments. I mean, they're all technically really special, but um, this is the first one that you're sort of like a cognizant, not adult, but adolescent for. Um, the earlier ones, you're like in first grade and fourth grade, so uh, this is like the first big kids one or whatever, and after I got confirmed and I was gra graduating eighth grade that year, moving into high school, it was just kind of like a big time, so my parents said that I could choose a gift, and I think I had read in the newspaper or something that Elton John was coming to play where I lived, and I said, that's what I want. I want to go see Elton John. Um, I was a huge fan of his music all growing up, and I played the piano, and I took lessons pretty much my whole life from the time I was like four years old. Um, and by this point in time, I had already been playing his music a lot um, and singing along with it, so it was really, really special to me. And the concert was really good, but we were late getting there, and we missed one of my favorite songs, which is Benny and the Jets, and I was so devastated because it was like the one I was looking forward to the most, and my dad's pretty big into music as well, um, and he he's also a very generous person, and so he campaign for us to go again, because it was a two-night show. He was playing on like a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night, um, and so I'm sure my mom was like furious, but he bought us tickets to go again the next night, and we made sure to get there in time, and he played some different songs, but he did play Benny and the Jets, so that was awesome. Um, so, after those sort of average experiences in terms of how a concert could go. Um, the 
next time that I went to a concert, I was 14, and I went to go see a Atreyu, and this was just an all-around weird experience because my entire family was flying from Atlanta to, I think we were going to LaGuardia, but somewhere in New York, um, the next day. And so I sort of like begged and begged to go to this concert and all of my friends where we were going home to were also going to go see this concert, but I wasn't going to be around for that specific day. So I was dying to go and I was huge into a tree at the time, so it was just like a once in a lifetime feeling for me that it just, just so happened that we were going to be in Atlanta the night that they were playing. So I don't know how, but I somehow got permission to go. The catch was that my dad came with me, which I am 100% positive he regrets to this very day and probably to his dying day because the venue was really, really cool. If you've never been, if you live in the Atlanta area or you're ever stopping through, there's a place called The Masquerade and it's a really, really cool concert venue. It's set up to where the basement level is called Hell, the ground floor level is Purgatory, and the top level is called Heaven, and that's where this concert was. It's a pretty small venue, but sometimes they have three different shows going on on each level, so I thought that was pretty cool and worth mentioning. Um, it was a fun show because I was hyper and happy to be there, but Atreyu really sucked live. Um, they didn't sound good at all, and that was kind of disappointing, and I sort of got lost into the crowd, and my dad was standing back somewhere, I guess, keeping an eye on me, but he really did not have a good time, um, and that was the first time that I sort of got, like, contact high. I didn't actually smoke anything, but there was so much smoke in the air that I definitely got high just breathing it in. So that was interesting. Um, but overall, I had a really good time. And I got to see people crowd surfing for the first time, which was cool too. Um, and it was just a really awesome energy, I guess. I did actually go to one other concert at that same venue. I think it was in hell though. And it was a rave series called Fuck Yes, and I don't know if they still do that, but it used to happen, like, annually. Uh, so that was pretty cool, but after the Atreyu concert, um, my dad was definitely not happy, and his, like, ears were ringing, and I definitely didn't hear the end of that one, but I'm still glad in retrospect that I went next concert that I went to was the Mamba Wamba of all of my concert experiences. So, I was a sophomore in high school at this point, and my brother was a senior, my older brother was a senior, and we went to the same school at the time. He was about to graduate. I was about to get the hell out of there because I hated it so much. Um, anyway, I was asked to go to this concert with a guy named Jason, who I think was actually in my brother's grade, or at least one grade above me. And we were just friends, and he really liked music, and I really liked music, so um, it was very symbiotic relationship, I guess. We liked to talk about music and play and listen and sing and all that, so uh, he had, I think he had asked someone else to go, but uh, they couldn't or something, so I ended up going with him. 
um, and we were actually going to see a band called Shine Down, um, but the headliner of the concert was Three Doors Down, who I've never really liked. Um, I don't hate them of all of the bands in that sort of genre, like Hinder and God Nickelback and all. I like really despise most of them. Three Doors Down, I don't like hate with a burning passion, but I don't, I wouldn't choose to listen to their music. However, I'm so glad that I went to this concert because it ended up being one of the sort of funniest nights of my life. Um, that's a mean thing to say, but so I showed up to the concert on time. I met up with Jason. I had a little Samsung flip phone. So it was like, where are you? You know, texting and we met up and we went inside and we started listening And obviously since we were there for Shinedown, we wanted to be there in plenty of time to um, See them play before Three Doors Down So we were hanging out and having a good time And eventually Three Doors Down, Shinedown came on, they were great, we enjoyed it Then Three Doors Down came on and at some point during those moments, those songs that were being played, this guy came up to me, and he was, um, he was actually one of my brother's friends from school, and I kind of recognized him, but he had never, like, acknowledged the fact that I existed before. He was one of those really, really snooty people who, since I wasn't pretty or at all worth talking to to him. He kind of just pretended I didn't exist. Um, so it was very strange to see him coming up to me and I was like, hey? He's like, um, yeah, your brother's getting arrested. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? I thought he was just kind of like pulling my leg or something. I was like, yeah, your brother's getting arrested outside right now. And I was like, oh shit, so Jason and I went sort of like running to the front and the attendants told us that if we left, we couldn't go back in. So I was like, okay, whatever, like he can deal with it. I don't know what he did, but my brother wasn't nice to me at all at this time. Um, he was sort of also one of the people who treated me like I didn't exist. So have like a feeling of, oh, I have to save him or help him. Um, I was just like, you know, he wouldn't do anything for me, so <laughs> why should I do anything for him? It was warranted though, um, so don't think poorly of me. <laughs> um, so we went back into the concert and there really was nothing I could have done anyway and I wasn't going to make Jason, who invited me there in the first place, waste the rest of the night, and I wasn't gonna, like, waste my ticket in front of him, essentially. I thought that would have been incredibly rude, so uh, we went back into the concert and had a good time. We enjoyed the rest of it. Um, he offered me a beer at one point, and I said no, because I was, you know, a good girl, and uh, he was totally fine with that. He was, like, a really good guy, upstanding gentleman, has a family now really cute. Um, anyway, so here was what was going on in the meantime, though. This is all, obviously, secondhand information to me because I wasn't there. But apparently what happened was that my brother was swayed by his super cool friends to put a bunch of bottles of liquor in his pants, like, in his pockets, essentially. Um, you know, those little, like, airplane bottles, essentially, and flasks of liquor that they were going to drink during the concert, apparently. And what he didn't know was that there were cops at the front of the venue, and they were doing pat-downs on everyone who was coming in. So, as he's getting closer to the front of the line, 
he and his friends realize, like, oh shit, you know, they're, they're patting people down, so they were probably more looking for, like, guns and stuff, but, uh, my brother was full to the brim with alcohol, and he was 18, 17 at the time, so obviously he wasn't of legal age to be drinking by a long shot. So as soon as he realized what was happening, he sort of took off running, I guess. This is what I heard anyway. And, um, a lady cop chased him and ended up having to tackle him in the parking lot. And I guess they sort of, like, tripped over a curb or something, or he was scuffling with her in one way or another, and he broke her glasses on top of that. So, that was, uh, an interesting story, and when I was picked up from the concert, um, it was very uncomfortable, because my dad was in the front seat driving, my brother was in the passenger seat, having just been picked up from jail, and I was in the back, high as a kite, because there was so much marijuana smoke again at this concert that I got super duper contact high. So I was just sitting there like halfway trying not to laugh, halfway hallucinating, and also like, this is so weird. <laughs> like I was, it was one of those situations where life was like bigger than itself and I just kept waiting for my dad to like explode on my brother thought he was going to be so incredibly mad, but he just didn't say anything. Maybe he didn't want to have that discussion in front of me, um, which is fine, but it was very tense and awkward, and I'm sure that I got into the car just like reeking of pot because when I talked to my brother, After high school, we kind of had a period where we were semi-friends again. He was a really big asshole to me, um, from like middle school through high school, and a little bit beyond that point as well. But when we were kind of talking in the middle, um, I remember at some point he told me that he remembered me being high that night, and the night of the Atreyu concert too. Um, so. I wasn't really, again, I didn't actually, like, hit a joint or anything, but they didn't have vapes at the time, so, um, I didn't actually smoke anything, but I was definitely high by proxy, so that was an interesting time. Um, so, I don't really know whatever came of my brother's arrest in terms of what my parents ever did about it. I know that they probably paid out the nose for his name not to be in the newspaper. And also, if you don't know this, in the state of Georgia, in America, um, prisoners are the ones who do highway pickup, side street pickup, and trash and recycling. So, if you're an inmate and you're on good behavior, then you get to be one of the people on the garbage truck or on the recycling truck who um, collects the garbage and they have like a cop that's there and kind of watches the whole thing as it goes down. If you get arrested and you're not like an inmate, um, usually in terms of like probation, you have to do street cleaning, so you'll go and put on like an orange vest and be there with the rest of the other felons, I guess, and uh, clean up on the side of the road any debris, like garbage or limbs or whatever needs to be cleaned um, throughout the town, so it's kind of like a little bit of a public humiliation thing, I feel like. and there's a sheriff who stands and watches, so you always know when those are prisoner people, because there's a big, 
like a sheriff's vehicle there and everything. It's a huge sort of display. So I think they're well-meaning programs, I guess. I definitely think it's good that they're giving inmates the opportunity to uh, do the garbage and recycling because that's then a skill that they can use and also it helps them sort of assimilate and prove that they're ready to leave jail, I guess, or whatever. Um, anyway, I don't know why I went off on that tangent, but my brother didn't have to do that, and he didn't uh, have his little name in the paper as far as I'm aware. So I'm sure my parents had to pay a lot of money for those things to happen. And I remember instead, though, he had to do like some ridiculous number of hours of community service. And he ended up working at the Boys and Girls Club for like the whole summer, every day, like eight hours a day. So he definitely uh, paid f for his mistake. But that was a funny night for me. It probably would have been less funny if he hadn't been such a dick, but he was, so it was funny. Um, next. So that was my sophomore year. And then junior year, I switched schools. A lot of you know this, so I'm not gonna give the long version, but I switched schools and I met my best friend Jasmine. And by my senior year, she graduated because she was one class older than I was. And it was towards the end of my senior year that I ended up leaving home, um, like for good, and I had nowhere to go. So, as I mentioned, actually in my worst dating stories, story time, um, I was staying with these two guys who I worked with at the time in their apartment, and I stayed there for probably a couple of weeks. Um, but, I mean, obviously I wasn't trying to bother them and stay there forever, so eventually I needed to find some place new to stay, and I had talked to Jasmine, and she knew, obviously, that I left home and all that, so she offered me to stay with her, and she, at the time, was living at this house with one of her friends, um, and it was downtown, like the beginning of downtown, in the most sketchy area possible. Like, hands down, it was awful. Like, every third house was just, the windows were bashed in, they were like crack houses. So this was the second half house. Half, of course, being Avenue. It was on Second Avenue. And they were renting this house, probably because it was what they could afford, and uh, they just wanted to be out of their own homes as well, you know, trying to be adults, so they settled for whatever they could take, and the house was pretty big, so there was plenty of space for me to stay, but it was disgusting. It was so freaking gross, and it was constantly filled with friends who were also drug addicts. Um, at this point in time, I had never... Had I? I might have gotten high with my brother. I don't remember. I think I got high with my brother when I was a senior... Junior? I don't know, but... Um, kind of ironic, or funny, I guess, that I can't remember. Um, so, I wasn't like a drug user, though, at this point in time. I did smoke cigarettes constantly, uh, but I didn't do drugs. So, it was a very different experience for me. And my first night at the second half house, I walked in the door, and straight ahead, there was an incredibly pale white boy with long, blonde dreadlocks, and sitting on his lap was a tiny 
little black girl who like I think she was like five feet tall even she ended up becoming like one of my friends um, and she had a twin brother their names were Monique and Malik and I really liked them and hope that they're doing well uh, but she was I guess dating this boy at the time or something and I walk into the house and there's like kids on a couch and Jasmine and her roommate are like here meet everyone and there were a couple people in the middle of the carpet too just like smoking and chilling out and they just like bombarded me and were like you've got to see this guy's dick and I was like what like what are you talking about they were like this kid here, you have to see his dick. It's as big as a baby's arm. And I was like, no, that's fine. And they're like, no, seriously, you've got to see it. It's the craziest thing. It's like a baby's arm with a fist at the end. And I was just so, like, taken aback because I wasn't in that sort of culture at all. And these people were very, very free-spirited and just, like, slept with everyone and we're always getting high on something or another so to them it was like really no big deal but to me it was like I literally couldn't believe it was happening and the kid like shimmied off his pants and Monique started like making out with him and stuff trying to like obviously speed the process along and I was like no no I'm fine I'm fine and thanks and like, I was like, Jasmine, where are we going to stay, you know? And we went down the hallway. So that was an interesting welcome. Um, and I ended up becoming friends, I guess, with these people for the next, like, year and a half, two years, something like that. Um, and their network of friends was insanely extensive like they knew everyone so I knew everyone after a while but I was still definitely one of the shyest people in the group and probably one of the most reserved people in the group although some of those characteristics definitely fell to the wayside when I started like actively using drugs with them which obviously I'm not advocating that. I'm glad to be, well, yeah, I haven't done drugs. I haven't done any hard drugs in, since 2011. So I've been essentially nine years without doing anything more than smoking weed, which I also haven't done that since December. So, um, I don't frown upon people who smoke weed, but I just can't anymore. Um, so anyway, that's all completely beside the point. <laughs> um, this house was very, very strange and a lot of very strange things happened there. I watched people get tattoos in that house. Um, I heard a lot of people having sex in that house. And there was a game that we played that was called Do Your Best Jagger. Essentially, at any point in time at all, someone could come up to you and say, do your best, Jagger. And no matter what you were doing, you had to stop and do your best Mick Jagger impersonation. So, a lot of times, to be funny, I guess, some of the guys would knock on the door while people were having sex and make them do their best Jagger like naked um thankfully i didn't have to witness a lot of those but they did happen pretty often makes me wonder if there was some other motivation but yeah that was an interesting game and then uh one of the people who lived there with us was called beans because he did a lot of beans and he um tripped acid one day and really messed with him. That happens, unfortunately, for some people. 
um, you can have, I guess, a bad reaction and it really changes, like, who you are. Uh, so I don't know if he was doing other drugs at the same time or what, but he got really, really fucked up and he started believing that he could teach himself to fly. Um, he thought that he could find, find his center. So he started doing all these, like, you know, stretching things. And he came home one day with all these books on finding your center. And we were like, what are you doing? You know, and he was in the family room, like, doing all these weird stretches and, like, jumping off of the couch. And he was like, if I find my center, I can teach myself how to fly. And we were like, oh, shit. Um, we ended up getting him help got him to a center to get treated, but he was really weird for quite some time. We really had to keep an eye on him, and one night we didn't keep an eye on him, and he ended up, um, we ended up finding him downtown at, like, four in the morning, and he was completely naked and, like, sitting with a statue of, I don't know, someone who was relevant to the town, so I'm glad that we found him before the cops did. Um, he also, one day we were like cleaning the house and he went on a really long rant about how stoves are amphibians. Like actual stoves, like where you cook stuff, were amphibians. And we were like, okay buddy. And I think it wasn't long after that that we um, got him to a health professional. But that was an interesting time. Um, there was also an infamous wheelchair that was actually stolen, which I still feel bad about. I had nothing to do with that, but apparently one of the people, like a few doors, three or four doors down from where we lived, um, had a wheelchair and it was like on their lawn or something. So one day they just took it and like brought it back home. So people were constantly wheeling around the house in this wheelchair. It was just so incredibly strange. And the house was really dingy and like run down and not safe at all. Like anyone could have walked in at any point in time. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the people who I hung out with were completely random strangers. Um, but we always just assumed that everyone was known by someone because, like I said, there was such a large network of friends or, like, acquaintances. It was kind of like the drug underground of that town. Um, so I ended up going to so many random houses and parties. I have these, like, snippets in my mind of places that I have no idea where I was, um, not because I was, like, really out of it or anything, but because I would just end up in someone's car, or I would be driving and have a bunch of people in my car and they would just tell me where to go, or we would walk somewhere and end up at some random person's house party. It was always something different, and there were plenty of times that we actually had to run away from the cops, and Malik and Monique had another funny story. Uh, one time we were running away from a house party that was getting busted up, and they were cracking me up because they were, one of them was like on probation or something, and was making all these jokes about not going back to jail. It probably doesn't sound <laughs> funny, it probably sounds really sad, but at the time, when you're like living in that life, nothing really seems that real, I guess. Um, everyone in that group felt like they had no future and no home. And that was kind of the reason why we all stuck together. Um, we were called the tribe and Everyone was family to each other. Um, 
they were shitty people and they would fuck you over in a heartbeat but at the same time if you needed anything they always would help I don't know how that exactly works but they were generous in a weird way but also they were drug addicts so they would do whatever they felt like needed to be done in the moment without really thinking about the long-term consequences um, but after I left Second Ave House I didn't know where to go um, I wasn't able to pay rent there so that's why I had to like leave uh, I think and I don't remember if that's even true but I feel like that's why I had to go um, because Jasmine and her roommate started butting heads really badly and getting into fights a lot and I think Jasmine's roommate was like she needs to pay or she needs to get out she can't just stay here all the time even though there were kids there all the time and I was still going to school <laughs> but whatever um, I ended up having to leave and I stayed with this gay couple in Alabama for like the rest of the school year until I graduated and then I started working full-time and rented a house um, my parents actually helped me rent that house because for like a whole year I didn't talk to them um, because we had this really bad fight and I got back into contact with them because I felt bad I guess um, which obviously in the long run was a bad idea because now I haven't talked to them in like three years so you know true colors always shine through but at the time I was young and obviously I didn't want to give up my family no matter how bad the situation was so they agreed to help me get this house to rent like cosign or something like that um, because I didn't have credit and I was really young um, but I needed some place to stay and that was kind of I guess their apology in a weird way um, but that house ended up becoming like the new hotspot essentially for all of these kids to stay um, and do more drugs so it wasn't that great of a time in my life in terms of my success and ambition I felt like I really belonged with those people um, you know the gay couple that I stayed with like I didn't even know them at all the first time I met them was when I was gonna go stay the night like they were just friends of friends and they heard that someone needed a room and they offered me to stay uh, in one of their rooms so stuff like that was like made you feel like people had your back um, on the opposite end of that when that whole chapter of my life came to a close um, things got really dark for me and I don't want to talk about that because YouTube is like really picking up on those things at this point but I made an attempt on my life and ended up in a hospital for a while and while I was in the hospital um, those same kids broke into my house through the back door window and stole like anything that I had that was of value um, cash, my xbox, um, my grandmother's pearls like literally anything I had that was worth anything they stole and they also broke into my car which was parked in my driveway because obviously I didn't drive myself to the hospital and um, they stole my iPod and they also stole I had a guitar it was a, a Fender like mini Stratocaster um, and they took that too so everything that I had they took mercilessly and when I went home and realized you know that that had happened um, I pretty soon after that moved and 
I just became a complete hermit for like two years. The only people I hung out with were Jasmine and um, my best friend Matt. So it was an interesting roller coaster time of my life. There was all kinds of weird stuff going on. I saw more things in those two years than I've seen probably in the whole rest of my life. Um, and it's kind of, even though there were definitely ups and downs to that whole situation, and I'm not, again, I'm not like condoning um, being a drug addict by any means, but number one, it's something I'm glad that I experienced because I think I was in the right, like, period of my life to realize that this isn't what I wanted to do. I know I was fresh out of high school, I was working full time, I was just, like, living my life for the first time outside of the tiny little shell I had grown up in, and it was the first time I was really exposed to anything real. I was sheltered pretty, pretty hardcore um, growing up from a lot of reality. Like, I didn't know that people could be so bad. I didn't know that people were so different than they were in my home or in my school. Um, it was very eye-opening, and I was at a very, like, influential period in my life, um, where I was very impressionable and figuring myself out, so I'm glad that it happened then, because I feel like if I'd have become a drug addict, like, later in my life or something, I might not have been able to ever get out of it, but because... I was at that age, I think I was able to realize that that wasn't the life that I wanted for myself in the end. And so, the next year I went back to, well, I started going to college um, at a local college that I ended up actually graduating from eight years later. Um, and I still did a lot of drugs. Uh, I'm not gonna lie about that. There were kids who I would meet in class, I guess just because of the way I was dressed. Um, like I had a very alternative skater. I was a scene girl, so people could just take one look at me and assume a lot. And I used to have people just come up to me and be like, hey, do you wanna like smoke this or do that or whatever? And of course I was just like, sure. You know, I didn't realize, I was so desensitized by the second half of house tribe that it didn't seem weird to me. So, I definitely had a lot of weird moments between classes where I would just like go into some classmate's car and like smoke something random or like take a pill or smoke something off of a spoon and not think twice about it. Now, though, looking back, I'm like, what the hell was I doing? Like, I can't believe that I ever was that person, especially because I'm incredibly shy now and I have all these anxiety issues, which, I mean, probably being on all those drugs didn't help with me having, like, an anxiety disorder. But, um... It was kind of cool, not the stuff I just said, but the fact that I don't feel like that was a type of culture that a lot of people had a chance to experience. It was very, like, hippie, Woodstock, free love, you know, peace for everyone, very philosophical. We talked a lot about life and death and Nietzsche and, like, all kinds of philosophy and astrology, and we learned, I learned a lot about things that were not taught in school. So, um, in that aspect, it was really cool. 
that I was exposed to all of that stuff and got to experience a different side of life that I definitely would not have had if I had just gone to college right away and not left home and all that. So, um, I hope that makes sense. I'm not saying that I did a good thing during those years, but I mean, not very many other people have that experience from what I've gathered. Um, it's rare for me to meet someone who feels like they were in a similar situation as I was. And those people were honestly some of the funniest people that I've ever met. And I really did have a lot of fun times with them. And they really did teach me how to be confident and not give a fuck about what anyone else thought and to just be, like, to just live and do whatever felt right in the moment and not care about all of the constructs of society. Um, since then, I've definitely become way more reserved again and I don't have that attitude anymore at all but it's kind of powerful to know that I can have that if I can tap into it in some way um, that I can live for myself and think for myself critically even um, and not be fooled by people and also now to know that you know Sometimes it's a wolf in sheep's clothing when you meet with someone. So, with those kids though, this is rounding back to the concert part of this story time, um, there were two venues that we went to that played local music. And I talked about these in my one of my Patreon videos recently. Um, but the first place was called The Core, and it was actually in like the basement of a church um, but all of the music was like really cool metal music it was very very interesting and I mean good the bands were really good some of them were local to the area I lived in and other ones came from like Atlanta or Macon or other parts of Georgia and Alabama and they were like on tour and they would come to the core and that was so much fun um, and I'll never regret those days because those were just really good fun memories and then we kind of outgrew the core and we were becoming a lot more like scene and goth and grungier than the church really wanted us to be, so someone ended up opening up a venue across town called the Galleria, and that's where we ended up going for all of our concerts from then on. And I also mentioned this in my Patreon video, but there was a band called the Irish Front, and along with um, Duck Duck Goose and Ocean is Theory, they were my favorite bands that came through, uh, and the Irish Front actually had a song called Monsturbation, and it had a female singing part in it, and when they came to town, uh, we asked them ahead of time if they were going to play that song, because we really wanted to hear it, and they said, no, we don't have anyone to sing the female part, and I said, I'll do it. And they were like, really? And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, so it was such a fun moment because they played the song and it opens with a very, very iconic, uh, I don't know, entry. So we were all like super hyped. And then the girls part is kind of in the middle of the song. So the singer, the lead singer, slash screamer, like, very slowly and gloriously, like, handed the microphone down to me 
on the floor and I sang the female's part and they were like really surprised that I didn't totally suck <laughs> and that was just a really fun moment I guess um, it's something that I would never ever have the balls to do again now I should say but I'm glad that I did it then it was cool um, we also went to a concert at Macon College we went, Jasmine and I went to go visit our other friend um, and we saw like gym class heroes and Asher Roth and whoever else was popular around that time uh, and that was cool really I was mainly there for gym class heroes because they were one of my like favorite sort of scene-ish, punk-ish, Warped Tour-like bands. I never actually did go to Warped Tour, which makes me sad because I really liked all of that music at the time. I don't think I would want to go now, but I definitely would have gone then. Um, so yeah, that was that whole sort of chapter of my life. And the last concert that I went to with those kids, um, or who I ended up hanging out with of those kids, was Between the Buried and Me. And we drove from where we lived in Georgia up to North Carolina. It was like a six hour drive or something like that. And I was literally sitting in the flatbed of a truck the whole way up there. And we were just like smoking blunts and looking out for cops and it was super dark out because it was a late night concert and I ate like a whole pack of Airheads Extremes on the way up and I got really high of course and then we got there and the concert was amazing it was so good and they almost played like the Colors album all the way through um, or they may have actually and when we got to like Viridian and White Walls uh, there was a mosh pit and I didn't realize it but they were like right behind me and I was just so transfixed on watching the show that I just was super unaware and some guy was you know like thrashing around and punched me like right in my kidney in my back and it hurt so badly like I don't know if you've ever been hit in the kidney hard like really hard but it made me want to like shit my pants and throw up at the same time luckily I only did one of the two I ran outside like as fast as I could and just immediately vomited because the pain was like so intense um, and I threw up like a rainbow because I had eaten all those Airheads extremes <laughs> and like the people who were letting everyone into the concert um, I think they just thought that I was like drunk or something so they were like mad at me for puking like right outside of the concert venue but after a while I think they realized that I was hurt because a couple of my friends like had come out with me and were like oh my god are you okay and I ended up going back in and watching the rest of the concert but I think that's how I um broke a rib and have had these issues with my back ever since <laughs> so that kind of sucks but the concert was really good and if you're wondering between the buried and me sounds exactly like the album live so good um, since then I've gone to a number of concerts but none of them have been as eventful um, I went to go see Modest Mouse which was like a dream come true because they're one of my well they are my all-time favorite band um, they have very few bands that I consider even close to their importance to me I guess so that was probably like 
the most iconic show for me, and it was really good. Um, and it was in this cool place called The Shed, which is actually also where I saw Waka Flocka and a bunch of other people because there's a, well there was, they stopped doing it now, but there was a festival here where I live that would last like Saturday and Sunday every summer um, and they would just have four stages across this huge area that's a it's a steel factory that's been around for a really long time so it's got this really cool like steampunk kind of vibe and they just have so many great bands that come and because of that festival I went I went twice uh, two different years and then they stopped doing it but I got to see Waka Flocka, Fantagram, uh, Run the Jewels, that was so good um, who else did I see? Odessa, that was cool. Oh, I saw, um, shit, what was his name? I can't believe I'm, like, blanking on his name because I was obsessed with him for the longest time, but he sang May I Have This Dance, uh, with Chance the Rapper, and he had a he had another song, I think, with Kanye, too. I can't remember. Um, I saw a lot of really cool bands because of Sloss. And I also got to see, um, what's his name? Oberhurst, the guy from, uh, Bright Eyes, who, he's kind of a dick, actually. So that was a bummer, but his music is super good, so that was cool. Um, and even though I saw him at his mouse in the shed, that was a separate concert all of its own, which was cool. I also saw Iron and Wine, who, if you don't know them, they're like kind of a soft folk indie, I guess folk band, and they make such cool use of different instruments. Their stage was my favorite of any band I've been to. I loved the setup, and actually the picture for my tier two Patreon with the little puffy clouds. That's their stage setup. Um, and that was beautiful. It was so good. I loved that. Um, and I also saw Churches, which was a really good concert, but I was disappointed in her singing live a little bit. Um, I feel bad even saying that because, like, I really like her, but there were certain parts where she wasn't actually singing like the high notes. Um, if you know churches, there's a song called Bury It, and when she says bury it, it's kind of higher pitch, and she was putting her head, like, down all the way and hiding the microphone, and I could tell that they had recorded it, and she was just hiding the fact that she wasn't actually singing it. So that was a little bit of a bummer, um, but I'm sure her voice was probably sore from touring, so I get it. Um, and I also saw a band called Always there. They were good, too. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, I can't really think of anyone else that I've seen, so hopefully I'm not forgetting anyone, but those were all really good concerts. Um, the only thing that kind of sucks sucked about any of them was that there's always one stupid drunk girl who's like hitting me with her hair constantly and like yelling jeers to the band and somehow I always end up standing next to that person and it just annoys the crap out of me um so I can't say that I would enjoy going to a concert for that reason um I just don't like dealing with the people especially now that I've become super introverted again and don't get out as much or talk to people as much and it's not really my scene, ironically enough. But I hope that these stories were entertaining. Um, I know I wasn't perfectly fluent in 
and delivering them, but that's kind of just how it goes when you talk, right? So, yeah, I appreciate you guys uh, letting me share some of my past with you, and I hope that you enjoyed having another story time. Um, if there are any things, like topics that you'd like to hear me talk about um, and share some memories or experiences about, definitely let me know because it's hard for me to judge what is, like I said, worth talking about. So I hope that these were worth something and I hope that uh, you guys maybe thought about some of your own younger year memories and if you're going through that sort of sticky period in your life right now where everything's weird and you're still figuring out who you are and partying and just kind of not caring about what happens tomorrow or if there is a tomorrow. Um, I would just say that don't get yourself killed but enjoy the experiences that you're having because the memories that you make are going to help define you and help you realize how powerful and diverse you can be um, and the different strengths that you can sort of tap into as yourself because you change a lot throughout life and you cycle through these different sort of personalities based on your growth and how you feel and what you're worried about or not worried about um, our surroundings, our settings, and our personal pressures and familial pressures and societal pressures all change us, at least momentarily um, and it's kind of good to have a weird period in your life that you can look back on and say, like, you know, things were not, uh, easy or good or neat and tidy at that point in time, but I learned a lot. So just be open to what you're learning and try to find some truth or wisdom or personal value in the experiences that you're having. Uh, sorry if that got too deep, but I hope that um, you guys enjoyed this, like I said, and I will see you in my next video. <laughs>